All right, cool. Hey, everyone. Um, all right, let's do this. So it's on the back of the popcorn boxes say, like, wait for the participants to slow to uh, one to two joins per second before um, you, you take out the microwave. Anyway, so cool. Um, please, 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 just um, as a for um, a, uh, pr a preface, please, please, please add comments to chat. This is supposed to be an interactive session. We're going to be building hopefully this uh, more or less together. Um, if anyone wants to join the um, audio video participation to uh, be one of those like uh, champions of uh, progress, then please, please also request to share your audio and video. Okay, so far so good. So for the first part of, so basically in this session, we are going to build essentially a privacy preserving Kaggle using a Oasis network, which is a layer one blockchain that provides confidentiality. So if that didn't quite make sense, I'll give you a quick slide deck to demonstrate. Can everyone see my screen? Yes, no, no, okay. Okay, I think, thanks for answering. Okay, solid, excellent, excellent. All right, so privacy preserving computation on the Oasis network. All right, so I'm, I'm Nick, and this is the intro to what we're gonna be building. So this is the platform. So Oasis Network provides confidential compute. So essentially it is as though your computer, a computer you're running on or a server is inside of a trusted uh, black box. No one can get in there. The only person you can see the algorithm or the data is the computer itself. So Oasis enables this and we're going to see how the Oasis SDK allows you to build these kinds of applications very easily. Okay. So basically the whole reason for confidential compute is that data breaches are making uh, consumers' lives really hard. So you have um, like Equifax breach just not too long ago. Uh, nothing's come of that yet for some reason. Like no one seems to, uh, there's no re um, like retribution. Uh, people don't really trust like social media. I would love to see a privacy preserving social media built on blockchain. That would be fantastic. Um, but then Oasis is a breath of fresh air if, from the status quo of corporations farming you for information. So basically on this network, you can build secure and decentralized applications that keep data private. So how is this even done? All right, so let's take what we have as a status quo. So you have untrusted infrastructures like AWS, GCP. The untrusted applications, well, they're not untrusted. It's just that you have to basically trust on blind faith that like Netflix or Facebook or Twitter isn't just stealing your information or doing bad things. And then if they don't have, if you, in the, even in the best case where they're not doing anything malicious, they can always inintent, unintentionally have a data breach, which of course is uh, quite bad. So instead, what you have is these smart contracts that run on a distributed ledger. So everything's auditable. You don't have to trust these centralized parties. The computations themselves are run in what's known as trusted execution environments. And then basically that allows you to run confidential machine learning algorithms inside these t trust execution environments or T's and the data providers and the data consumers can be separate entities. So I'll, I'll go more into that when we actually get to the architecture of, of the demo we'll be building. Okay, so entire integrity is done by smart contracts. That's what blockchain does, Byzantine fault tolerance. And then on top of that, you have the, sorry, so the distributed ledger gives you Byzantine fault tolerance and the smart contracts run on the ledger as they're all familiar with Ethereum. And then each of those smart contracts runs inside of a trusted hardware enclave, which I'm sure you're familiar with at this point with like SGX, Keystone, AMD's SEV, Trust Zone. So actually this, um, this year actually, I think in this uh, coming quarters actually, Q3, we're gonna be seeing a lot of developments in the T ecosystem. So it's not just SGX anymore. Like no one likes SGX. There's also um, SEV. There's also a AWS Nitro Enclaves, like all those things. And then Intel's newer version of SGX. All, all those things are coming in the recent months. So it's not like T's are dead. T's are just getting started. Okay. So that is the intro presentation that I had for you.
Uh, does anyone have any questions so far? No questions. Okay, so is everyone ready to start building? So do people want to like build or do you want to like watch me build? What, what would you prefer? Oh, a bit of both. Okay, that sounds cool. Okay, so let's get you all, I'll get you all, let's get you all started with, um, so I'll build it and you can watch if you want and then I'll provide the, I'll provide the code for you to build it yourself. Aha, okay, so great. There's a, there was a uh, question from, I don't want to mispronounce your name and there's like no way to actually pronounce, like have you pronounce it. So um, I apologize in advance for not pronouncing it. Anyway, so um, yes, we do have the trust that hard, we do have to trust hardware makers that the hardware is secure unless you are yourself a hardware maker. So part of, well, one of the developments in the T ecosystem is called Keystone Enclave, which is um, Keystone, Enclave, so .org or something like that. Anyway, yeah, so Keystone Enclave is an open source uh, RISC-V T that you can build and actually instantiate yourself on a um, on basically an FPGA if you wanted to. So it's really just a matter of distribution. So if you really didn't trust anyone, you could use the whole um, Oasis network to schedule the jobs, well, essentially the smart contracts on your, on your own hardware if you so um, desired. But yeah, there is always this like fundamental trust somewhere. And then even if you're actually running crypto, uh, like pure crypto algorithms, right? You still have the threat, like your threat model is still that you shouldn't have the, a, like a, a highly sophisticated attacker with access to your hardware. So like for instance, um, if you're familiar with fault attacks, like RSA is vulnerable. Yeah, there's no remote attestation for Keystone just yet. That would require, I mean, it's all in place, right? If you're familiar with Sanctum, the, there was a paper like quite a while ago. So trust zone, yeah, trust zone, there's no attestation for that. Like that was never part of the plan. Um, SEV has attestation. Keystone has attestation eventually built on the same thing that uh, that Sanctum uses, which is basically generates a key pair inside the device based on um, uh, ring oscillators. Yeah, it's pretty cool. So the ring oscillators, you have like a um, stable extraction function and then you just give them the public key keep a private key, operator signs public key, and then that's their attestation key. Yeah. Um, yeah, actually getting that distributed to like trusted people is the hard part, right? So like it's very, it's generally kind of bad for to get to give like government agencies and like people who can like decap your die with like a fib. Uh, generally don't give them your CPUs, but like, um, like AWS GCP, like at that point, like if there's enough legal recourse, and your jobs are not like super, super, super highly valuable, then it would seem reasonable to, that there would be someone that you trust to simply run the hardware. And at that point, the T's are essentially fungible. Okay, excellent, fantastic questions. Thanks everyone. Okay, so let us move onward to the demo. Okay, so the first thing you'll want to do is head over to docs.oasis.dev and <laughs> okay, so first thing I want to do is head over to, I, I we can circle back at the very end if there'll be questions. Like what's probably gonna happen is we're either gonna like run way over time because there's so much code to implement or um, way under time because I just like burned through it super fast. Uh, we'll see. Anyway, so Docs Oasis Dev, um, that's our doc site. So you'll want to click on, I want to develop an app. And uh, if you scroll down just a little bit, you'll see install the Oasis toolchain. So if you just copy and paste that, um, and if you don't trust it, you can always just uh, go to the URL. It's a pretty simple Python script. Um, basically, it just pulls from the Oasis tools bucket and installs Node.js and stuff. So if you wanted to download it yourself, if you're super paranoid, or have some, or don't particularly trust us to have good software, you can just download them directly from the uh, Oasis tools S3 bucket. Okay, so since I reasonably trust the S3 bucket, basically I will do, well, I already have Oasis. So I'll just do Oasis set toolchain latest, just to make sure I have all the new stuff. Okay, perfect. And then the repo uh, de jour is, Actually, yeah, no reason to use the yell key. And the repo is ready layer two. Okay, fantastic. Um, 
wish I had a second monitor so I can like see what you guys are seeing. Anyway, that's unavoidable. Okay, so if you head over to the repo, okay, so the idea is basically to have, um, basically to have Kaggle. So if you're familiar with Kaggle, um, basically you have these people who host machine learning competitions and they might have some, oh, I think someone wants to join audio. Okay, anyway, so um, Kaggle has basically people who host competitions and they have public data and um, people participate in those competitions and upload their models. So in most cases, um, in most cases, the data is fairly private. And then once you have a good model on that private data, you want to extract value from it and not simply give it away. So if you're familiar with um, Numeri, this is actually closer to the Numeri approach, except with um, actual confidential um, training and test data rather than not exactly MPC. Um, if anyone's actually looked at the Numeri, the way they do data ob obfuscation, like, does that actually make sense to anyone? Because, like, to me, it seemed as though they were uh, not actually anonymizing the data, which is bad for them, but whatever. Uh, okay, so basically, so anyway, back to what we're trying to build. So uh, essentially, so in our case, you have these data providers, so the competition people who post competitions with public training data and private test data. The private test data is retained so they can have a fair competition at the very end. And the models from the participants are kept private until out of band or in band or whatever, you can implement that. The uh, winner of the, of the competition agrees and gives their data to the uh, competition organizer. So because on-chain resources are fairly expensive, we would like to do all of the heavy machine learning off-chain. So um, basically you have your uh, blockchain going doing its thing. You have data sets that live on chain with their confidential state with and the data encryption keys. You have off chain data. And then once you want to train, evaluate the models, you start a, an off chain job that requests a test in an enclave that attests itself to the blockchain. So there's your root of trust. It then receives the data encryption key into the enclave, pulls the data, including the model, and then evaluates the model and posts back the winner. Okay, so that makes sense to everyone so far? And feel free to say no, if that doesn't make any sense at all. All right, cool, excellent, excellent. Um, yeah, I'm guessing if any of all the rest of you are probably still busy installing the tool chain and what have you. Anyway, so first thing I'll do is um, build it. So I will run make. Okay, so in the meantime, while it's doing that, I will do Oasis build. So Oasis build is um, a sort of like a meta build tool that builds both Oasis uh, services, which are written in Rust, and TypeScript applications, which are generated and then consumed as the client. So you have this sort of um, Rust backend with a TypeScript front end, which is like a ish the best of both worlds. You can write everything in Rust if you wanted to, but I, I'm guessing most people would prefer to move in a bit of a higher velocity language, especially when deploying to things like the decentralized web. Okay, so it seems as though Shuff does not exist on OS X. And I developed this originally on Linux, or GNU Linux, depending on how, many, how much Richard Stallman um, you listen to. So I'm just going to comment this part out, and I'm going to type make. So I actually don't know who's going to win anymore because the before the shuffling was all um, was based on the random seed. So entropy dot bin we just checked in. Okay, so it's doing the thing right now. 
anyway, so let's just start, let's actually start by implementing. So let's take a what we have right now. So in the demo directory, we can see the off-chain components. So let's not, we're not going to be building the off-chain components in this part of the demo just because they're like a little bit finicky, but basically you have some models. So train models is, so train models is the part that actually generates the model. So this part runs locally on your machine because um, obviously don't trust pickle files loaded from untrusted sources, but basically model A is a support vector classifier and the model B is an Adaboost classifier. The data set is um, not quite private, but it will fit on your machine and train relatively quickly. And that is And right, so and that is the iris data set from everyone's favorite uh, UCI repository. Anyway, so if I run, okay, so I run the make file, it will, mm, uh, make clean. Okay, so if I run the make file, the first thing it's going to do is spawn the huh. Why is the test accuracy zero? Oh, of course, because it's not shuffling. Uh, does anyone know what the Mac OS shuff, shuff uh, command is? Give me a sec. Okay, here we go. G shuff. Okay, so let's not, so not to be interrupted by that. So anyway, so the models would normally train and the off-chain evaluation program is dockerized. So basically once the training is done, a you will call the evaluator.py on the um, confidential data and confidential models. So the evaluation program takes the model path, which will be either model A or model B, which is decrypted inside the enclave. So Evaluator Pi runs in an enclave. So it will take the decrypted model that was decrypted by the runtime and it will take the data and it will load the trade private test data, load the private model, and then return the score. Okay, great. So let's work up let's like bubble our way up the stack a teensy bit. Okay, so the that was the, the evaluation program, right? So in general you need a sandbox to make sure that there's nothing that's going to break out of the enclave. So let's take it let, from a take a step back. You have the on-chain service, right? That has all the um, secrets. You have this thing, which is in, in an enclave that needs to fetch these secrets. So in general, you want this thing to also be a sandbox so that it can perform attestation and run the thing inside of it. So this is more of like a general off-chain compute kind of workflow. Uh, what you, if you had something more specific with like any arbitrary so if you didn't have an arbitrary evaluation program that was written in Python, not that I would recommend that, but for the purposes of the demo, that will work fairly well. But if you had a, um, a very static program, you could actually build that all into like a monolithic runtime that does attestation and the actual thing that's supposed to do. But in this case, we have a harness that lives around the um, contained thing and the contained thing runs in a sandbox. So the sandbox in this case, we're going to be using is Docker. You could imagine using a VM, you could imagine using um, also Docker with more with like a user space kernels like Gvisor and you can also consider uh, using uh, like a, another another kind of VM like Python like a language VM not just like an like a hardware VM uh, KVM and then you can also use like a WASI run uh, a WASM runtime which actually gives you very strong sandboxing properties if you use a very restricted set of externs like WASI. Um, I highly recommend WASI. WASI is pretty cool. If you haven't checked it out, definitely check it out. Um, actually, the Oasis runtime, um, the one that we use right now, actually runs on um, WASI. It means you can actually write services for the Oasis platform using like C++ and junk. But um, Rust is probably the nicest because it has the best SDK support. So 
if you want to write C++ or C because you're a masochist or D or Go or Nim or Zig, if that's your style, then, like, go for it. Like, more power to you. Right up. Gshuf has been installed. Okay, so now let's go check out, as before we were um, waiting for Gshuf, we were, okay, see, so cool. So now the model trained, and now um, the test data is fake. Don't, don't look at that. You shouldn't be able to see this. This is because we're only in a demo. So model A uh, on the training set gets a lower score than model B, but on the test set, model A should win. So at the very end, you should see that um, the person who submitted model A would win. Okay, so now let's check out the runtime. So evaluator.py, remember, is the Python program that we run inside the Docker sandbox. This would be different for every competition. And then the evaluation sandbox, sorry, the evaluation runtime is a TypeScript file that basically uh, runs, creates an attestation report for itself based on um, the, so like it would do like, for in SGX, it would do like E report, um, and then that would trigger the signing, uh, send it back out, that would go to, um, probably not IS, because IS is like a really bad idea in general, but you could do something like DCAP attestation, which is certificate based. Um, AMD SEV attestation is similarly uh, and I believe that Amazon's Nitro Enclave attestation will also look about like that. Yeah, certificates are good. Centralized um, attestation services are bad. Nothing too controversial said there. Okay, so anyway, so this runtime uh, connects to the gateway, connects to the, the competition service, fetches the secrets, and spawns a Docker Where is that? Oh yeah, so evaluate, so it spawns a Docker container containing evaluator.py. So these lines right here, if we go to async evaluate, basically just runs a Docker container with no network um, and a sandbox input volume that contains the encrypted data. So encrypted data goes into the evaluator, this, this enclave, the enclave decrypts the data and then mounts it directly into the um, sandbox program as decrypted. So it gives it the decrypted data path and then the decrypted model path and then retrieves who won. Okay, so if this is Rust, so it's still taking a while to build. And um, yeah, so maybe by the end of this, it will finish building and we will be able to see the outputs. Okay, so now we're gonna enter the Ah, good question. So thanks. Thanks for answering that question about DCAP. So yeah, this is a good segue. So DCAP is better than, yeah, DCAP, DCAP directly is certainly better than IES. So the, um, currently we have like a, a implementation of DCAP attestation where you have the, um, so this is an SGX v2, which they are actually going to basically can, an SGX v3 is going to come out beforehand. But if you were to use DCAP, um, there is a way to fetch the DCAP certs directly from Intel. So again, you're still trusting Intel, but um, imagine you have like an attestation on-chain service. Uh, basically what you do is first the off-chain part would fetch the, so you're in a T, right? So you would have a, a it's instantiate a TLS connection to Intel, fetch their certs, take the no, re, most recent certs, the, cert, the entire cert chain, pass that into the service, and then the service would verify it and you would actually bake in the Intel root key into that service uh, or smart contract service equals smart contract. If you weren't, if you weren't, uh, if you didn't rock my parlance. Yeah. So you just verify the search chain independently and you don't actually need to trust the host for anything but availability. Okay. Uh, cool. So at this point we are going to transition to writing some code just to show you. So I'm going to abbreviate it a little bit, the hard parts, just so you get an idea of like what we're doing. Um, basically building service. But before we begin that part, does anyone have any questions? And again, good questions so far. Thanks so much. Okay, fair enough. Let's uh, tentatively start the coding part. Okay, so 
let's check out. So all the Rust services are in services, and that's just a cargo project. So if we do CD services, let's start by building out the user registry. Okay, so user registry is basically going to be this thing that people use to log in with a username and password. And um, they will receive a JSON web token, uh, which is just like OAuth. So you can imagine a service that does OAuth in a world where OAuth doesn't require... So, okay, in a world where Google OAuth didn't have this like thing where they like literally rotate their JWT signing keys like every two weeks, and then also didn't have a root key for like whatever reason, then you'd be able to have a, like a, an on-chain... Uh, service that does OAuth at a station using Google OAuth, which is pretty cool, I'd say. So anyway, let's just like get rid of all this junk right here. And yeah, I don't know. I don't know what this is going on about. Okay, uh, that's easily fixed. Anyway, so let's ignore that for now. Okay, so Oasis build will always build the entire thing. So we only care about building user registry right now. So let's leave in the tests. So we're gonna be develop, doing, te let's call it test-driven development. Okay, so I'm gonna delete all of this and we're gonna make a quick user registry. Okay, I'm gonna leave that part in. Okay, nah, we'll just get rid of it all. Okay, let's start from the very beginning. This will be fun. Okay, so first we start with our dependencies in the cargo tunnel, right? So um, ignore this part for now. Uh, okay, so you have dependencies Oasis CD and the dependencies Oasis test. So Oasis test basically provides a um, essentially an off-chain, sorry, uh, a, simulated, a simulated blockchain, which we generally don't use because it's easier to just use the um, Oasis chain uh, directly. That just literally starts up a blockchain. Pretty cool. Does the job. Anyway, so let us start by writing our first service. So we have the tests. These are just normal cargo tests. Nothing's fancy there. So let us start by using Oasis SCD ABI. That's the um, serialization, deserialization, deserialization primitives. If I recall correctly, we will probably want a map. And we will probably also need context and address. Okay, so to create a new service, we start with a struct. So structs, the fields of the struct are confidential state. So we need uh, JWT secret, and let's call this a vec u8 um, and we probably need users which is going to be a map from string to user okay so in order to actually make this a service we just need to do a little bit of code gen oasis uh, build does all this for you so we just do drive oasis scd colon colon service okay and then there's one other thing you need to do, which is generate a main function using Oasis CD service user registry. Okay, so far so good. So now in order to actually implement the RPCs of our smart contract, we simply do impl user registry and then create a, let's create a constructor, no self. We won't be needing this, and it will return a self. So this is going to be, a, we're going to need some random bytes. So the JWT secret, um, this is going to be the thing that signs our JWT. So that's going to be um, some random bytes. We're going to need those. So let's mark that as to do. And we have users, which is a map new. Okay. So let's actually get to that part about getting secrets. So um, the Oasis 
platform is um, based on WASI, right? So um, WASI has this extern called WASI random get, which we implement as, I wonder if I have it here. Okay, so while it's doing that thing, so we need to, let's just see, oh, there it is. Okay, so Wasi runtime, Wasi runtime, uh, H Mac D R B G. So the, our, so the random number generator is a um, cryptograph cryptographically secure uh, pseudo random number generator. So basically, um, you, know, our, the, you can just get, so instead of using block hash directly, you can just use um, Rust. Um, basically, you're just trying to Rust primitive. So if we just then put back the um, rand, rand PCG. So rand is the Rust random crate, and then rand PCG is a particular random number generator. So we don't need SHA2 yet, and we don't need JWT just yet. Okay. So if I put these back, again, we don't need that quite yet. So we have um, RNG, seedable RNG, and we can create this by doing um, rand PCG. Uh, There's no way I remember the syntax for this. It's gonna be like PCG64 something something. Yeah, PCG64. So let's see what that actually does. Actually, no, it's gonna be let mute JWT secret equals back. Uh, 32 bytes. Ninety-nine percent sure it's from entropy. There we go. From entropy, return to self, and then we do fill bytes. Cool, so that's so far so good. Um, so now let's, everyone on board so far? Anyone getting bored? Too much rust, too little rust? Okay, let's forge onward. Okay, so let's implement some RPC. So if we look at our tests, we need, what exactly? We need a register method, we need a sign in method, and a verify token method. So let's start with the register method. So it's going to take a mute self. It's going to take a name, string, password, string, and it's going to return a void. No, it's going to return a result. And it's going to be either void or error. So let's go over here and define pub enum. So one of the cool parts about the um, the Oasis build tool is that it um, it actually knows the type, so it doesn't just, it doesn't actually work with the syntactic layer. It works at the um, it works on the type layer, so like basically it hooks the the Rust compiler, so it knows what types you're using. So to permission to die, it's always a nice one, and username taken. Cool. Uh, Great, so self.users.entry. Where did that go? There we go. Righto, I wonder else I deleted. Okay, uh, self.users.entry name match entry occupy. Vacant. E insert password. 
Okay. Cool, so far so good. So that's our first RPC that's called register username password and it inserts a user, it creates a new user if that user doesn't already exist. Not super secure, but that's okay. You can imagine using something like a private key, like a MetaMask wallet kind of thing. All right, so next one is, time do you have left? Okay, we have a little bit of time. So I'm gonna implement um, two more. So the sign in, I'm sorry, I'm going to implement one more and then we'll just get verify for free. So this is going to be the hard part, um, the interesting part, I guess, of so sign in. It will be a, an at self because JW keys are stateless. And we will have, I'm going to sign in tick. Use name string password string results. And that will return a JWT and otherwise an error. Okay, so match self values dot get name none. Let's change that to if password equals. So all this is done inside of an enclave, so um, as part of the blockchain, so none of this will actually get out. The passwords are secure, so you don't actually need to, if you trust the underlying security model of the blockchain, you don't actually have to um, hash the password, you can just compare them, compare them plain text. It's like having, it's like ba it basically HTTP, HTTP basic authentication. Um, password, and this is going to be a, I need to deref that. And then, whew, do I remember how to, the API for JWTs? No. So I'm just gonna, I'm just using this to remind myself. Oh yeah, this is gonna have to return a user, shoot. Oh yeah, this is a bit tricky. Uh, okay, so does anyone mind if I just like, not type all of this out? Cause like, there's no way I'm gonna remember it. I'll just go through it. Um, but basically this part's not too interesting. Well, it's interesting, but it's not interesting. Basically it's on-chain JWT. So if the um, password is the same, create a new JWT token, JWT, sign it. The subject will be the username and the audience will be the address of the service that wants to consume it. So, and then verification will check. So verif when you do the verify, it basically does the inverse. Um, if the, it gives you back the user for the token if it's valid. So it checks the signature and it makes sure that the sender is the audience. So in this case, our case, the sender is going to be the campaign service. Okay, so let's move on to the, um, so we run the test now, it will pass. Hey, oh, okay. Okay, so the test will now pass, um, good. So now let's go on to the competition service. So this is the one that actually does the um, machine learning competition. Aha, I see some I see some comments, never enough Rust, more Rust, Rust is the best. I'd gladly write everything in Rust if I could. Yeah, so the whole part is about TypeScript existing is like a little bit sad, but like whatever. Anyway, so the competition is you have the user registry, which is the service that we just created. And you have a training data set, which is public authenticated data. So you have a URL and a, a hash, which we're going to assume is uh, the SHA-256 SHA hash. And then you have an encrypted data set, which is not just authenticated, but also encrypted. So it's just a ASGCM with a key and a tag. Okay, so the evaluation program is going to be the public um, stateless program. So in our case, it's going to be evaluator evaluator pi 
And so that would be our, our evaluation program. The submissions are users to encrypt the data. So models are also located off-chain URLs, off-chain off -chain URLs with encryption. And then an end timestamp. So that's when this comp the submission competition will end. Okay, so, uh, so as before, we have our constructor. We already know how constructors work. Uh, get public state is a workaround um, because all state on Oasis on the Oasis platform is private. You need a, an explicit getter. So whereas in Ethereum, you would actually have the gateway uh, looking at the block and actually able to see what the public state is. None of it is actually available to the gateway. So you actually have to make a, an explicit RPC in for the um, blockchain to decrypt it and give you back the public data. It's a good way to prevent foot guns. Anyway, so when you submit, it's pretty simple. So you, um, if you're accepting submissions, uh, a certain error. Otherwise, create a client to the user user registry. So clients are auto are generated code. All you need to do is specify in your Cargo Tamil, uh, package metadata Oasis, the service name, dependencies, and then pa pass it a path to the uh, Wasm. So the Wasm is actually a little bit interesting because uh, we don't just give you the Wasm. The Wasm contains the um, basically the ABI for the service. So instead of having these like ABI.JSONs from Web3, you are pack them straight into Wasm. So we can do Oasis IF extract dash O standard out target service user registry.wasm. You can look at that. Actually, let's look at JQ. Yeah, so user registry, it defines some types, constructor, all the RPCs we just defined. And uh, yeah, so basically that allows us to generate Rust and TypeScript code. So if you want to look at the generated TypeScript code, we can go to app service clients, user registry. And then if you look, that's that's the inline byte code. Don't look at that, it's ugly. Um, we have like the errors that we define there. They're just enums and the RPC. So export. Yeah, so basically here are the um, RPCs in TypeScript. Idiomatic TypeScript means you can just basically call them without actually. So if anyone's familiar with Protobuf and how bad Protobuf is, like the whole point of actually doing this, so we, you can actually like write in a language that you're comfortable with. So even the Rust code looks like Rust and the generated TypeScript code looks like TypeScript. It's just like, it's like a, it's like a little bit of like a, it's like a, um, it doesn't like matter, but it like feels, it feels good inside to write idiomatic code. Anyway, so you create a user registry client uh, then you ask it to verify the token, and if it verifies the token, you insert the submission. All right, so now we get to the part. So, so far, that's the public part when the competition is open. So now, once the competition has closed, we get to do the interesting part. So the types that are interest matter here are attestation report, encrypted secrets, and begin evaluation, announce winner, and authorize evaluation program. So the evaluation program runs is started after the com competition ends, and it runs in an enclave. It attests itself as again to the to the competition service. So this would be authorized evaluation program. And as the comment right here says, if this were a real attestation, we'd validate the signature. But you get the idea. So um, I don't have that crate with me right now. It's like a private crate, I think. Not a private crate. Just like in a branch somewhere. But basically, you just have like a um, a search chain validator. It's like pretty simple. It's just, yeah. BKI. Anyway, so the begin evaluation um, is an RPC that is called by the Enclave post attestation, and it then gets the secrets for it to run. So if we head over to uh, demo, we can see the whole workflow um, from a very high level. So the first thing you do is create a user registry, the service we created in the, the first part. So it's that all you do is user registry dot deploy, give it a gateway, participants. Um, so you model A is Pegasus, model B is Ada Booster. We register them. Uh, we upload some encrypted data sets. Create a competition, make some make the submissions. Then once that's done, we wait for the submit the competition to end, and we run the evaluation program. So imagine all of this stuff right here runs in an enclave. So I think Docker was squawking at me just a while ago about something or other. So anyway, here's what's happening, making the submissions, starting the evaluation program enclave. So it's not really an enclave, clearly, because it's all running locally. All right, Docker. All right. 
All right. Um, Okay, so I can always shell out to yarn if I wanted to. Anyway, so I'm just changing the temporary directory so it'll actually work. So, um, yeah, so if this were actually working, and it does work in CI, I, I actually promise that it works. Like, I, I did add CI for this. You don't take my word for it. So it'll fetch the encryption keys, the enclave, announce the, um, evaluate the models, and then announce the winner. Okay, but let's, like, actually see that in practice. Fingers crossed. All right, all right. Okay, let's see where it creates the data sets. So download and decrypt. Okay, so if we go to demo data. So all the, these are all of the encrypted, so the encrypted models are here, encrypted data are here. So we actually are encrypting. So if I did cat um, random bytes as expected, so if we go to Okay. So if that doesn't work like you will please have to forgive me. Um it works on Linux. Um macOS is great. Ish. Oh, it works. Yeah, there we go. All right, cool. So Pegasus has won the competition. That all happened inside the Enclave using trusted execution environments. If we actually had those configured, you can actually do that if you were using like GCP or um, Microsoft or Azure's uh, SGX offering. I wouldn't use SGX. SGX is pretty bad. But anyway, so that's like basically the entire demo. And that's how you can build a privacy preserving Kaggle kind of program on Oasis. So like obvious next steps would be to actually train the models in the Enclave instead of just evaluate them. But like, that's pretty straightforward, right? You still have like the Docker machinery and um, it's just a matter of writing the code for it. Cool, so does anyone have any questions? Thanks again for um, watching. I hope this was uh, informative and exciting. And yeah, questions, questions. And if there are no questions, we can get back to the questions from before. Right. Okay. Um, if there are no questions, then I guess we can go through how Oasis uh, RS works. The yeah, that's probably one of our more interesting things. So I'm sure you're all familiar with like the rest of the, so there's been a lot of convergent evolution in like the uh, smart contract programming space. So if you actually look at near protocols, TypeScript SDK, and um, uh, yeah, and Parity's Inc. Yeah, those back when, back when that was like the main differenti differentiator for blockchains and everyone was really interested in how to like, how the how do you program SDKs? Sorry, how, how do you program smart contracts? Um, there's been a lot of convergent evolution. So I think what we've, so I think that I would like to say that Oasis RS is probably the most, um, I would be very happy if people borrowed the ideas from it. But basically I think the main takeaway is that it's very important to actually go in there and have the, ha hook the compiler very, so do the effort, actually put in the effort to hook the compiler, get the types out, construct an IDL and like protobuf or something, and then actually generate idiomatic code. So I think that's like a real win for developer experience. Like right now, for instance, you can just generate types for clients for your uh, services, which I think is pretty cool rather than having uh, 
dyna this dynamic JavaScript. It makes it so that your whole stack end to end is more secure uh, in that types are easier to test and audit and, and all those nice things. So as we found in uh, actually at Oasis, like building these enterprise-y sort of applications that, yeah, yeah. So yeah, that's what I wanted to question. So yeah, so building these enterprise applications, we found that like this whole um, building the SDK using, sorry, yeah, building SDK using like these like auto, nice auto-generated types is actually quite helpful. Especially when you get into like languages like Go and you want to have these like sort of like off chain um, parts that you tend to trust. Yeah. So anyway, so to answer Chad's question, um, does Oasis use Wasm? Yes, Oasis in does indeed does indeed use Wasm. We don't just use Wasm, we use WASC, um, which is a set of externs provided by well, it's a standardized set of externs that basically provides like a POSIX ish feeling kind of thing that Rust has compiler support for. So there's actually a called a WASC libc. So I can search that up and basically it is a libc implementation so basically you it translates the uh syscalls of um of like rust so i can actually go find it for you okay so um so yeah so basically the rust calls are translated into uh, STD. And it's going to be in libstd sys and it's going to be in wasi. So like we can see like things like fs. Uh, right, so these kinds of things are, so like all you do is open a file in Rust and it gets translated into wasi libc, which is like translated to externs. So actually if we look at uh, wasm nm dash e target service. Well, actually, no, we want i competition wasm. So we see that it wants fd prestat, environment sizes, args get, blah, 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 blockchain transact. So that's our one of our extensions to wasi, just because um, it's kind of hard to express the idea of like transferring value and arguments and that kind of jazz without dynamic linking and other sorts of things. And then if you look at um, user registry, we have things like random get as well which we ended up having to use yeah and that's all implemented inside of the uh wasm runtime and it allows you to actually write c plus plus code as i said before so you can go to oasis labs cpp demo uh nope zig demo so basically we have this demo uh written in zig because zig also supports wasi so this is like a really dumb one uh, basically, uh, it gets an environment variable. For the set. So the sender is an environment variable, as is the uh, current address. The input is centered in, and the output is centered out. So you read the input from centered in, get a random number, and then you write the output to centered out. So um, this would be executed on chain, and you would get that output. Kind of cool. And that was like just like a benefit of using WASI. So um, I, there was a lot of hullabaloo back in the old days but, um, when people weren't sure if the, adding these extra layers of sandboxing was actually worthwhile. And I think that it really was choosing to use WASI. So there's a caveat there, and, and, and that is if you do want to use a WASM runtime on blockchain, WASI is probably a right thing to use. But I wouldn't actually recommend using WASI at all, um, or sorry, WASM at all, just because like, um, like how often is it that you are writing a uh, an application that really should exist on a public block, like not a public blockchain, but just like able to be called from any service, like or smart contract. So things like ERC twenty are fairly uh, generalized, and like maybe you can consider calling an ERC twenty from some other contract. But let's consider simple examples like Compound, um, Uniswap, and like CryptoKitties. Right? Those are essentially self-contained ecosystems that all only just call their own that call their own contracts. So I think it would make a lot more sense going forward to adopt a more, uh, to basically adopt like a more um, confined uh, self-contained ecosystem of like, not smart contracts, but essentially statically linked binaries. So like imagine the competition service that we just built, right? You had like user registry and competition. So imagine a world in which like the whole thing just runs in Docker, right? And you have like a single executable that um, like basically has all of your blockchain as FS, as FS abstraction. So like file system equals uh, like try and you, 
Yeah, so basically the user registry would be this thing inside of the same thing as the container, as the as the competition. Like you have backup competition and then you have like gRPC straight into like your, well, not necessarily GRC, gRPCs, but like instead of imagine having a Wasm runtime, you have like this, this re- collection or essentially uh, registry of user created runtime. So it's like, it's like moving one layer down, recognizing that it is simpler and more secure to build these contained ecosystems that don't suffer from like like re-entrance, re-entrancy attacks, given that nobody is actually calling cert contracts that they didn't write. So I think that's probably end game of block of it's not end game, but I think that like moving towards serverless computing and those kinds of abstractions is like an end game for blockchain. That's why I'd really like to see. Cool. Anyway, that was all the material I prepared. Thanks a lot for coming. Um, thanks for the questions. And I hope that this was, again, I hope that this was, you found this useful. So I think this is the end of the this session. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. And of course, um, feel free to, um, if you have any more questions, like feel free to hit me up anytime. I'm like, I really love questions, like making developers happy. Like as a developer myself, like I, this is like what I do and like what I do. So um, just, Shoot me an email anytime. You just want to chat about like random, uh, just random like Wasm blockchain stuff. Cool. Well, thanks everyone. Enjoy the rest of the conference. It was really great having this presentation.